Please join me in the reading of Psalm 119, verses 129 to 135. We'll read together. <clears throat> Your decrees are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. With open mouth I pant, because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your custom toward those who love your name. Keep my steps steady according to your promise, and never let iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from human oppression, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. Hey, good morning. We're going to sit right here. Tell me your names. Evelyn, Evelyn and, and Oliver. Uh, Evelyn's close to my daughter's Eve, E-V-E, -E, so barely close. And I'm Pastor Robin. And you're, are you visiting from Austria? Excellent. Good to have you with us. All right. So I'm going to, if this is, this is my Bible that I had in seminary years ago. And if I open the Bible right to the middle, where do you think I'm going to end up? Any idea? This is the Psalms. It's a trick my mom taught me when I was a kid. She's just like, if you open up in the middle, you always end up in the Psalms. The Psalms, which we just read part of one, are, it's, it's like an ancient hymn book. They used to sing these songs in, in, in Hebrew. And there are prayers, and there are, what, there are happy ones, there's sad ones, there's angry ones. The one we just read from, Psalm 119, is the longest psalm of them all. Can I show you? Like it starts here, right, and it goes boom, 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 and it keeps going and going and going and going and going. Oh, my goodness, right? And it's all about how much this person loves reading the Word of God, reading, reading Scripture and God's, the law and all of that. There are also really short ones, like Psalm 100. That's a good one. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Um, there's one Psalm that most, a lot of people know, and they, some, some folks memorize, is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Have you ever heard that one? Yes. Yeah, so you know that one. Uh, my person, one of my favorites is the 103rd Psalm, which has, I just think it's it has everything. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. And it goes on. That I think it's I, I, I think it's an underrated psalm. I think more people should should know this one. When during did you have lockdown in Austria? Yes. Okay, so you were in the house, um, but just like we were here, I found myself reading the psalms every day, and. Some of the psalms are happy, some of the psalms are sad, some of the psalms are angry. There's a great one, How Long, O Lord, which seemed like a good, a good prayer to be praying uh, during, during the lockdown. Like, how long, O Lord, will you forget us forever? What I like about the psalms is that people wrote these prayers, these songs to God with, you know, on good days and bad days. And, it's, you know, and when, when, you know, life was scary... It was a good reminder that, you know, there are good days and bad days, right? It can't always be good days, and it's never all bad days, right? And that's, so I loved the honesty of these, uh, of, of the Psalms, and I think it was a great practice to do. I find myself, I don't do it, I really loved the routine of doing it every day, but now that we're out of lockdown, I find myself, I don't do it every day, but I'm grateful when I do. Just because it's a reminder, um, and even the even the like the angry psalms or the sad psalms always rem end with a reminder that God is good and God is faithful and that God will see us through, right? So, uh, if you you know if you want to brag to your brag to your dad, you can say, look, I you know, sit down and read the whole 119th psalm in one setting, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I invite, you know, there's, um, 
you know, there's different versions of them. Some of them are, are more readable than the others, but it's a really nice way to remember um, that God is with us through all of it. Can we say a prayer? Yes. We're going to uh, close our uh, eyes, hold our hands, bow our heads. Gracious God, thank you for the reminder that you are with us no matter what, that there are going to be good days and bad days, days that we are calling out to you because we're afraid, or days that we're calling out to you because all we can say is thank you. Thank you for all, always being with us and being with us now. I pray that uh, that each and every day we might have a glimpse that you are and that you are with us, and we can thank you for that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 33, and then skipping to verses 44 through 52. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the, it is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in, his, in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it to shore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And just so you know, we love baby noise. A pastor from, my, from the presbytery where I live, Highlands Presbytery, recently wrote a, a blog and posted it just, just the other day, so it's been on my mind. She serves a church that... Uh, that I recommend, have recommended to some of you who have children who live in the area. I think she's fabulous, and, and, it's, a, and it's a great little church. And in this blog, she was lamenting the fact that she has lost some folks to Liquid Church. Are you familiar with Liquid Church? It's, I went years ago, and I think they have different campuses. I went to the one in Morristown. It's one of those churches that has, it was hosted at a hotel. They had volunteers who would come in every week and set up the chairs and bring it down. But it was, you know, had a, had a band in the front. It doesn't matter whether you sing or not because you can't hear yourself, right? Uh, and, you know, the pastor dressed in casual nice, sat on a, uh, sat on a stool and preached from that. And there just so you know, they were spot on in terms of their hospitality. We were greeted at the door. We were asked if we had any needs. It was at a hotel, so they validated our parking, you know, right off, you know. And, you know, if you had kids, if somebody would walk you with your kids to the, to the nursery, or you know, did you need any hearing devices, you know, all, all of that stuff. It was really well done. And the beginning of her blog article talked about, you know, she's like, I have a, you know, I have a great little church. We have a wonderful youth director. We have done, you know, we do mission trips. We have anywhere from two to 18 children on a Sunday, which she didn't write, which I want to say, and those two kids are your kids, right? <laughs> you know, but that, like, like all of, you know, all of our churches, you can have between, you know, two and 18, you know, on, on, on a Sunday. And she was talking, she said, is there some way, she was imagining out loud that, uh, and I mean, she also confesses that, you know, that her church is having to use some of their reserves 
to to exist and she knows a lot of churches we know a lot of churches who are in the in the same boat where there's good ministry going on but at the same time you know, they're having to lean on to, into their reserves uncomfortably and she was lamenting because the it's the, the music piece of it and she said you know is there some way that you know churches in our area could you know come together and somehow create a worship experience for the folks who are looking for that type of uh, modern music and because the old hymns don't speak to them and the reality I grew up in the church right so I in the old hymns you know you know can can speak to me I can tear up because my makes because I remember singing a hymn that my mom used to tear up with because she sang it with her mother and you know and and every once in a while we have one of those songs where you know I was meaningful to a lot of people because you can just tell Right. And but for folks who weren't raised in the church, they don't have that same, you know, oh, you know, uh, when you when they hear in the garden, because that's one of my mom's favorites or a, a little a little brown church in the wildwood. Do you remember? Dun, 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 dun. That's that's one my mom always loved. And so I'm always thinking of my mom when we we're singing that singing that songs, which you can't find in any of the hymn books anymore. But every once in a while, we'll pull it out. Right. But for those folks, so she was try, just trying to imagine, and she said that it, it and this happens in, on social media in my town as well, somebody will move in and say, hey, everybody, does anybody have recommendations for a, for a good church? And she goes, and I always recommend mine. <laughs> and then she said, and then you see a ton of people who will recommend in, in Liquid Church. And by me, it's this big evangelical church, and a lot of it, the draw is, is the music. Now, I, I say that, and I'm not recommending that you get a band. You know, I'm not saying, hey, you know, because you know, uh, the most important part of any worship service is that it's authentic to who you are. You know, my joke is like, don't give me a tambourine, because it'll be bad, you know, you know, because I won't do, that's not who I am. And so you, it, whatever, authenticity, you know, there are churches that, that do Gregorian chant. And there are people, that is their church. That is, that, that is their worship. That is their love. So it's, you know, and I want to say, if it's, if it's performance-driven, people will figure that out. If, you're go, if the church, if you walk into a church and you feel like everybody's just going through the motions, people will also figure that out. The most important part of worship is that it is an authentic expression of faith that invites people to experience the living God. Amen. And you can do that in all sorts of different ways. There are new expressions that we are seeing of worship, and that's fine. if the end is the authentic expression of faith that invites people into the experience of a living God. In our tradition, in the Reformed tradition, Presbyterian tradition, there is a, a logic to the way that we put the service together. We come into God's courts with thanksgiving, so we start with praise. Then we move into a time of confession. Why? So that we can open ourselves to hear the word of God so that there, there's nothing nagging at our souls that you, know, that you think you know, that between you and God. So we are able, we clean house so that we can sit open to receive the word of God. And then we proclaim the word. And then after that, the rest of the service is a response to that word. We offer ourselves back to God the way that God has offered God's self to us. And that takes different ways. But you know, when we, the offering, it's symbolic of offering ourselves to the living God. And we can do it through communion. We can do it through prayer. We do it in all different ways. Why am I sharing this? Because Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. I was more familiar with the other, the parables in this passage, but this verse jumped out at me this time when I read it. There are treasures new and treasures old. 
Now, my loose translation of this verse, every disciple of Christ who is working for the kingdom, you know, on earth as it is in heaven, is like a beloved teacher who shares what, with their students what they have learned and what they treasure, both novel and ancient practices, both new and old practices for their students to enjoy and employ as well. Do you, you remember the teachers, don't you, that who just loved their subjects so much that even, you know, even if it had no interest to you, they made it interesting? Like I, God bless you know, folks who, all the, um, uh, the sciencey, the sciencey, the sciencey people. The fact that I even say that tells you I was not a sciencey person, right? I would try and then just glaze. You know, I'd say, hmm. But if somebody really loved the subject, I could, you know, I, they kept me longer, right? But when somebody loves what they're talking about, you can tell and you get excited about it. We do this as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ. When we share with one another things that have been meaningful to us, old and new. You know, I start, start off worship with that deep breath. Why? Because I experienced that at a Presbytery meeting. One of the other pastors did that, and I went, oh my gosh, that was wonderful. To be able to center yourself, to then go into worship and already be present. Oh my gosh. When I go to worship services now where they don't do that, I, I'm, I usually join in probably after the confession because my mind is spinning with different things. And, and so I'm trying to, you know, to let all of that stuff go, but there's all this busyness going on of singing hymns and, you know, all this stuff. And then it's usually then, by then, I might use the confession time as a time to center myself. So now why do I share it? Because, oh my gosh, it was such a gift to me that I share it with others. We share with one another what works. Books we've read podcasts we've listened to, movies that have changed us, music we love, poems that speak to our souls, conference, conferences that we attended that, you know, that were just phenomenal, or you tell people, don't go to that, that's such a waste of time and money, don't do it, but if you want to use your, you know, go to this thing, this was fabulous, you need to sign up for this, we'll do that. Small groups that you've been a part of where the, when, that you want to share with other folks. The people are lovely, they're wonderful, they know what it's like to be new, and they're warm and inviting, and it has, I have found my peeps. You should come. Experiences that we are so grateful to God for that we got to be part of. Things are coming to mind as I say this to you, I'm sure, of experiences that you've had, or things that you're just like, yeah, I'm so excited about that, I told everybody. There's, in the movie Elf, I don't, I don't know why this came to mind. I've only watched it once I, you know, for folks who I know watch it every year at Christmas time. But there's this, there's this scene in Elf where, where uh, Elf, does he have a name or is he just called Elf? I don't remember. Buddy? Thank you. Buddy uh, brings his, his new friend, Zo who I know her name is Zoe Deschanel, I know the actress's name, to this diner and, and to drink this cup of coffee. And, he's, and he gives her the coffee and, and, and he's like, and she's like, what? He goes, it's the best cup of coffee in New York City, according to the sign outside, <laughs> right? And she's like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's really good. You know, like, it, mm, you know, you could tell it wasn't, but she was like, oh. But his expectation of like, I'm gonna share this wonderful thing with you, right? When we have that, Praise God, hallelujah. You need to come to my church because, you know, we feed food insecure people at my church. And not only that, we create relationships. We learn their names. We remember their birthdays. We'll bring a cake. We'll, we'll sing to them. You need to come to my church because they have the best Sunday school teachers who are just, who are just wonderful. They're gentle. They're loving. They get it. You need to come to my church. You need to come to my church because they honor seniors. You know, some folks, you know, I've been to churches where, you know, we're just forgotten, but at this church, we are valued, and we know it. You need to come to my church because they're like family, and I love them, and I know that you'll love them, too. The only way that big churches work is if they have small groups within that church where people feel loved and connected and that have that sense of family. That's the only way those, the, those big corporate churches can work. Your witness, our witness as 
as church folks is also the times that we sit with each other when we've gotten that awful diagnosis. And we are there for each other. Or we heard the news that our, that our lives are never going to be the same. It's the way that we share our time and attention. By the way, all of these things that I have been saying are things that you have said to me since I've been here. It's when I hear you say, I love this church, the people have loved me, accepted me, they are my family. Praise God. You've told me stories of when the church was packed and you had to open the doors and there was, there was seating on the side and, and I know now you wonder. And I would remind you that the gospel was written to people, this, this small group of people who were told, all right, go out and make disciples of all nations. And they had to have been looking at, at each other like, And to those folks and to us, Jesus shares these parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a small seed that grows beyond anybody's expectation. Or, or, or yeast, that is a, a little bit of yeast that is added to, it says three measures. It's like 60 pounds of flour to make 100 loaves of bread beyond anybody's expectations. And this kingdom is worth all that you have. People are going to think that you are crazy for what you're willing to sacrifice. But it's worth it. It's worth all of you. And so we share the treasure. And you are starting small again. When you call a new pastor, you're going to tell them, and you can choose your, your metaphor. We are seeking to, to plant ourselves in the community as if for the first time, to truly be a community church, that we pray like a mustard seed will grow to, to a... To a, to a large bush, almost like a tree where people will come and take solace in our branches or find home in our branches or feel safe in our branches. That they might know that God is and that God is with us and that the kingdom of God is worth our all. I've seen churches turn around with, with uh, the right leadership and, and the right attitude. It's, you know, we're, everything has been thrown up in the air. <laughs> Uh, and, and COVID has been a doozy on, on so many churches. And we are all learning and unlearning and relearning together. You know, I could think of two churches in my presbytery that I did not have a lot of hope for who have, who have gotten new leadership, and I, 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 I think it's just a, a love fest, and they are, they are you know, just enjoying being church again. They're loving on each other and they're doing things together and the pastor isn't doing it for them, they're doing it with them, but it's just, you're just, oh, praise God. Praise God. Mustard seeds, yeast, pearls, hidden treasure. God is good. Let me finish by saying that it's, by, it's all about the process and not the product. Your focus, our focus, is always on trying to be faithful. God, and asking the question, God, how would you use me today? How would you use us to share you good news in this community of faith? If that is our focus, that is, God will bless that without question. You will be blessed, and you will want to share the blessing you are blessed. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite Ken forward for our minute for minutes for mission to talk about his ministry in Austria. Welcome. Thank you. And yeah, first of all, we'll just thank you so much for your support over the years. It does, of course, mean a lot to us. And really, you're an extension. We're an extension of what's happening here, too. We're far away, but we're all part of the body of Christ, I, even though we're serving all the way over in Vienna, Austria. And I myself, well, I grew up at this church. I was already running around here as a toddler and have many memories. And I now serve for the fellowship called Calvary Chapel. I'm the pastor of Calvary Chapel of Vienna. 
And I've been there since 2005. My wife, Michi, is, I think she's walking our, our little one around, trying to get him to sleep. But, of course, the best way to share an update, I think, is simply through some pictures. So I'll just talk you through some of the highlights from this past year. Uh, this was, of course, perhaps the most, most exciting thing this past year, the arrival of Christopher. Um, our daughter, Evelyn, is there holding the little guy, and Oliver is next to him. Evelyn is 10, Oliver's 8, and Christopher is now 9 months old. As the, you can see in the next picture, you see him getting a little bigger and bigger. The next picture... He's uh, with me in uh, a rose garden in downtown Vienna, which actually Kaiser Franz Josef himself helped to plant. He was, in fact, a professional gardener. This is going back quite some time, over 100 years ago. But um, interestingly enough, uh, he got in there and got his, his own hands dirty. So I just find that an interesting side note. But... Of course, as you would, would be perfectly aware of, not all of Vienna is a rose garden. Uh, it's just another city, uh, I would say, because I live there. It, after a while, the, the facade, the, the, the shine kind of fades because this is just where you live. And just like around here, I've met so many people that wish they could visit the Big Apple and move to New York City. But for us, well, I don't know, at least for me, it's not such a big deal to be there, and you might not even go to the, the, the big city once a year, but so it is for us. We're in the middle of Vienna. Yes, it's a glorious city, but sadly, the spiritual picture, morally speaking, it's, it's very, very different, and unfortunately, there are very few good Bible teaching churches. Uh, less than 5% of the people are born-again believers, and... Uh, just for, by way of example, I haven't counted, obviously, but I believe there's more brothels than there are Bible teaching churches. Prostitution is legal over there. These things are just commonplace for a lot of people, unfortunately. And uh, yeah, so we do things like this, reaching out to the people, getting out to the streets. This is a, a street outreach, which we do about once a month, uh, painting and preaching in downtown Vienna. There we are uh, in the middle of one of the presentations. I was in that moment teaching, preaching in German, I mean in English, and Stefan, the leader, was translating into German. I would admit that was a good result that day. You could see quite a few people stopped. Some people, sometimes the people do just pass us by, go back and forth without stopping. But it's really such a calling to go out and share the truth because a lot of people are apprehensive. Uh, it is a very predominantly Catholic country. So a lot of the times the people don't even have the first idea of what a church like ours would be like, and so there's a great hesitation to come. So we really feel called to get out there at least once a month and share with them where they're at on, on the streets and meet them there. Uh, the next picture is at the Oasis. This is a refugee ministry, which I do still serve at uh, about uh, twice, a day, twice a week. Um, this is also from, happens to be from Easter where there was a good turnout of many people from Iran and Afghanistan in that case, uh, in that, that day. And so we're meeting these people from Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria still, and then really several countries from Northern Africa are still making their way to Europe for refuge. And so we get to share with them. In that case, they've really, most of them have really never heard it before. Whereas your average Austrian, have, they have heard of Jesus before. They're aware of what happened. They might not believe it in their heart yet that he died and rose again from the dead, but for these people, they're really hearing about Jesus, the truth, for the first time in most cases, so it's such a joy, and what an opportunity, because a lot of them are open and interested, and what does the Bible have to say? They've, they never got to have it before because it's banned in their country. The next picture uh, is a small group on a Wednesday night where we were getting to share with several men. In this case, they were from the country of Morocco, and nowadays we've developed something where because we don't have an Arabic speaker who's willing to come and translate for us, we found someone over Zoom. So this guy translates. He's a minister in the country of Jordan, and he translates into Arabic for us over Zoom. And in relation to that, there is an Arabic pastor that I do get to help with who's super active in the city of Vienna, Farid. He's from Syria, and I, I preach at his church about once, once a month, also a small group, but so precious the, the group of 10, 12 guys that I get to, uh, in that case, I teach in German and Farid translates into Arabic, of course, and getting to share with them. For them, some of them are asking such basic questions like, well, I, you've told me that Jesus died and was killed, but what did he do? What, what had he done to deserve that? You know, just 
super basic questions like that. Of course we share. Well, he didn't do anything to really deserve it. It was just a case of envy and manipulation of the situation, and they had him crucified. But in any event, um, this is what I'm mainly involved in at this point. This is our church. It's on the ground floor of a normal apartment building in, in kind of downtown Vienna. And so there are a lot of people that pass by every day even. So we regularly, on any given Sunday, do have new visitors. So there's a greeting. I pass on greetings from them. <laughs> so here I, I snapped a photo from on stage a few weeks ago. Um, there's my wife in the front row. We're an international, little international fellowship. Uh, very mixed in, in backgrounds. Any given Sunday, there'd be seven or eight different nationalities represented there. And I preach in English, and then my wife or someone translates into German. This was a neat testimony because, uh, sadly, about eight months ago now, our worship leaders of, of a long time decided to move on, felt led to move on to a new church. So we were wondering who would take their place, but various people from the fellowship stepped forward and now participate regularly. So we even have two worship teams now, even uh, this one gentleman who can play the violin, which we had no idea about until that need was, was, was presented. And so he now participates that way, which is just a real joy. Um, the next picture is also a special moment. This gentleman, I, obviously you can see, was, just had finished the baptism for him and from Iran originally, but came to me last summer sharing I honestly have no foundation. I'd never met him before, but he heard about, a ch about our church from a friend of a friend who comes to our church. And so he came and wanted to learn more about it because he just shared, I have no foundation in life. I just really need some help. And so, of course, I got to share with him and teach him and became a born-again believer. And then this spring, we baptized him. The next photo is a young man also from Iran. Uh, and uh, in this case... He came to faith over a year ago, got baptized last summer, and just now got approved his, I should say, his refugee status got approved. That was the day of his interview, so I got to go participate in the interview with him and, and affirm the transition, the changes that I'd seen in his life just by being there. And uh, the, thankfully, in this case, the judge approved it straight away after the first interview. Some cases it takes even three, four, five years before they present their case a second and a third time even this time, thankfully, the judge believed him right off the bat, and, and he has been approved, and so now he can now move forward with his life in Austria and start to work and so forth. The next picture is uh, an outreach to northern Serbia, and this was something new for our church, which was great. We got to go there for a four-day missions trip this spring, and that was just a real joy for me because our church, actually, I should have mentioned, but it was planted back in 1998 by another American missionary whose wife is from Sweden. And it was about two years ago now, he felt led with his, to move with his family to Sweden. And so to be closer to her family as they're aging and aging. And well, he passed on the church to us and I'm now the pastor, but this is the very first real mission trip that we got to take. So it was just such a joy. And there were about nine of us that went there and ministered with the pastor there and he's reaching out to a very poor community of gypsies in his neighborhood. And some of them are now, well, they're financially poor, but spiritually rich in Jesus. And so it was such a joy to be part of what was going on there. And then I think there's just one more photo of us repairing the roof for some of them. No electricity in their place, but at least they have a roof over their heads. And so it's really basic living. But again, our the pastor there is just doing such a great job of showing them the grace of God, ministering to them, and that, of course, is the most important truth of all. So while their life situation is difficult, he's bringing them uh, some help twice a week with food and bread and, of course, the message of God's love and grace. So, yeah, that kind of gives you a little bit of an overview of how things were this past year. Of course, not every day is as exciting as that. Those are just some real highlights. A lot of the times, it's just a matter of sitting down and studying for the next message, making some phone calls, writing emails, and encouraging the people in our fellowship or having our home group, which we have twice uh, a month. But again, just want to say thank you so much for your support, and um, please do continue to pray for us. We'll be headed back to Austria this Tuesday, so our month-long visit is kind of wrapping up quickly here, 
But if you would like to learn more about the ministry, please do connect with us afterwards in the fellowship hall, or just um, go ahead and sign up. There's a, there's a list you can sign up with your email address, and then you'll receive a periodical email update from us during the year. That's on the, the right side of the fellowship hall on the kind of table there along the edge near the uh, exit over there. And you could pick up one of the updates from this spring, too, if you'd like to see what they look like. But um, thank you so much. And please let us know later whatever questions you might have.